Dr. Pollard, welcome. Good morning, Chairman Alexander, Ranking Member Murray, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to speak here this morning. Affordability is the most significant challenge students face. I know this because I'm a community college president and I am also a person who lived that experience. While I was in college, I worked three part-time jobs and I relied on food stamps to get through college. Growing up from the south side of Chicago, I was the first in my family to complete college and my father struggled mightily with the FAPS application. Ultimately, those federal grants and loan programs got me through college, but they wouldn't have got me across the finish line in today's economy. This is the untold story of higher education today. Students who leave college without completing do so usually because of cost. When I look at the 8,600 Pell Grant recipients at my college, two-thirds of them have an expected family contribution of zero dollars. Their incomes are so low that they could not afford to pay any of their tuition. This is at a college where full-time tuition is less than half of that University of Maryland. Pell Grants are invaluable to getting students to the door of college, but many recipients don't stay because they can't afford their other expenses. Others, further on the margin, don't enroll at all. The cost of living has risen, workplace demands for post-secondary education has risen, but our national investment in a growing body of vulnerable students has not kept pace. At Montgomery College, thousands of our students rely to meet, rely heavily on college-funded programs to help make ends meet. We have a food pantry in all three of our campuses because food insecurity is so commonplace. We run free shuttle buses between our campus because students struggle to the cost of public transportation. And textbooks can cost almost $1,500 a year, so our faculty strive to use open educational resources. We set up a loaner laptop program because many students don't have computers, but many still don't have internet service at home. Many of these students already have Pell Grants. In fact, 26% of my credit students have Pell Grants, and another 53% have some form of financial aid, but that's not enough. These students are living on the edge. Poverty, not the lack of personal effort, is the biggest barrier to their degrees. Federal support hasn't kept up with this need in part because our image of a typical college student needs updating. That 18-year-old living in a dorm at a four-year college on his parents' bill is no longer the norm. While that student might be worrying about beer money or entertainment money, my students are budgeting for health insurance and child care. The typical community college student is 28 years old, works while she goes to school, and has that takes an average of five and a half years to attain a two-year degree. Nationwide, a third of all community college students are the first in their family to go to college. More than half of them are women, and at my college, 72% of them are people of color. And this is a critically important point to note when one considers the racial disparities in financial need, college debt, and family wealth. The provisions the federal government has made to support college students no longer match the demographics or the economies of our communities. At Montgomery College, the average income for our Pell Grant recipients is $25,000 a year in a county where a family of four needs $80,000 a year to subsist without help. The federal government galvanized a generation of students in 1947 when it acted on the recommendations of the Truman Commission to expand community colleges. The educational needs of today's students are equally urgent, and the government can answer them with six steps in mind. Raise the maximum amount of the Pell Grant awards to cover the true cost of college attendance. Peg the Pell Grant to inflation and free us from the annual debate about funding. Expand Pell Grant eligibility to those who are often forgotten when we think about today's students, ex-offenders, those without parents to verify their application, and dreamers. Provide federal aid for short-term credentials that allow workers to fill middle-skilled jobs, which change lives and strengthen the economy. My college's DOL TAC grant is a great example of the that dynamic in action, and Congress should reauthorize it and simplify the overly complex FAPS and verification process and draw more students in who are first generation, and encourage federal state partnerships and incentivize state investments. Let me end with what I know for sure. 
It benefits none of us if the family in which you were born remains the dominant determinant in how you're able to pursue and fund quality education. The reauthorization of the Higher Education Act is a crucible moment for my students. The working poor, the American with or without a birth certificate, the displaced worker, the ex-offender, the disconnected youth, and many more. I thank you in advance for what I know that you're going to do on behalf of those students. Thank you. Dr. Pollard, uh, let me ask you. The, the data is pretty clear that a uh, college degree or credential, including an associate's degree, uh, is necessary to compete in today's economy. Uh, and for many low-income students, provides them just a path to middle class. But as the cost of college continues to climb, many students have increasing concerns about whether college will pay off for them personally, mm. uh, whether they'll be able to land a good paying job, and whether they'll be able to even manage their debt. Um, what are some of the ways we can address those challenges? Thank you, um, Senator. I, I think a couple of things become pretty paramount in this. One is that I think we have to actually talk about the impact of not being educated in today's economy. Uh, we know that Georgetown Center for Workforce and Education recently released a study that indicated that 60% of all jobs in the future will require some form of post-secondary education. So the idea that someone should not have a path to education to ultimately increase the quality of life is struggling. It's a struggle for me to understand that. Our economy demands post-secondary education. We are in a knowledge economy, and to ignore that and to assume that some people can and should be left behind while others do not uh, is a problem for me as well. College and job training is a must. That's something we specialize in in community colleges. We know the lifetime earnings of an individual by having an associate's degree is over $600,000 increase. Baccalaureate degree is over a million dollars. So if indeed we are to make sure that everyone who is in the room is educated, we also think about the folks who are not in the room and work deeply to work partnerships to have that happen. There are some who have suggested that community college is already affordable or even already free for some students. Um, but I know that data shows that students are borrowing or paying more than $7,000 a year out of pocket for community colleges in, in Maryland, even after their grants and scholarships. So I think it's clear that we need to redefine how we talk about the total cost of college. Um, and I wanted to ask you, what additional costs should be considered when we look at making college affordable for all of our students? Thank you, Senator Murray. I, I would offer a couple of points in this here. Our students in community colleges are typically loan averse. Uh, our students are typically first generation. Uh, more often than not, they come from families where the idea of taking on debt is highly uh, irregular for them. And they also know over the long term, they're concerned about their ability to pay that back. So as a, as a result of that, this idea of looking at the total cost of education becomes a barrier for many of them. Child care, health care, transportation, uh, food, living expenses, all of those things that many, I love the reference earlier about the room and board. Uh, room and board exists even if you are in a residence situation or you're not. So how are you going to live? And if you have to make a choice oftentimes between providing for your children in your family versus yourself to go to school, even if you know the long-term implications for your family are better if you go to school, you will not make that choice to go to college. You will instead invest it in things you need to do, or you'll be looking at social services in order to be able to meet that gap. So it is a critical issue uh, for the students that I work with each and every day. The average median income in Tennessee is $50,000. So there are not a lot of rich people at the community colleges. No, there aren't. And I think the, the part that I appreciate about your comment, Mr. Chairman, is the fact that the issue stems back from the disinvestment or the lack of investment by states in public education, particularly at the community college level, but also across the board. In the state of Maryland, for instance, the master plan had been a third, a third, a third, a third from the local, third from the state, a third from the student. At this particular point, about 50% of my budget actually comes from the county. The student pay about 33%. 15 to 16% will come from the state. And that number has not changed in the last decade. In fact, it has continued to precipitously go down. So this idea of figuring out a way to help states understand that the investment in higher education is not just one simply about ensuring equity, which we all should be working toward, it's also about the economy. 
Let's be very serious about that. 20,000 vacant jobs in Maryland right now in cybersecurity. We know that contrary to popular opinion, there's not a lot of coal jobs coming back in our region. What is going to come back? Cybersecurity, technology, HVAC. So how do we start to invest those dollars to create the economy that we want to see? That idea of a public uh, federal and state opportunity for collaboration I think is essential. Otherwise, we'll continue leaving people behind in an economy where we don't have the luxury of that occurring.